Jacobite Rising of 1689 was the first of several attempts to restore the Scottish royal family, the Stuarts, to the Scottish and English thrones, united since 1603 under the Stuart King James VI and I in the Union of the Crowns. An administrative arrangement made mainly to simplify negotiations with foreign powers, the Stuarts' personal Union of the Crowns had endured through the 17th century until William's invasion in 1688. As the Stuarts' interest in Scotland waned, however, so did the benefits to Scotland from this regal union. It felt less like a partnership than a hierarchy where England always came first, a running theme you may notice throughout the film. While many Jacobites used this argument against William, the truth was that the Stuarts had long neglected the land of their descent as their ambitions had turned to more lucrative global interests. Nevertheless, Scots who wished for the dissolution of this regal union joined English rebels in laying responsibility for their two kingdoms' mutual troubles squarely upon the illegitimate invader William III and II, or, to his detractors, Dutch Billy. William and his Whig acolytes on both sides of the border, seeking a way to protect the British Isles from another Stuart restoration, now pursued the very opposite goal, ever closer union. They planned to cut off Stuart claims to the Scottish and English thrones by yet again selling out the British crowns to a foreign lineage, but this time also to render Stuart claims legally irrelevant by means of a momentous piece of legal chicanery. There was to be a full political treaty of union between Scotland and England, in which Scottish sovereignty would be dissolved and less than a quarter of its rebellious, inconvenient parliament merged with England's in Westminster, replacing the Union of the Crowns with a formalised conjugation that would help to birth a monstrous new colonial superpower, the British Empire. Those in Europe who stood to lose power to this new Leviathan now encouraged the Jacobites like never before, and for much of its first 50 years, this fragile, so-called Great Britain seemed more likely to collapse than to endure. It was in the aftermath of this Union of 1707 that the greatest opportunity for a Jacobite revolution in Britain presented itself. Never before or since was there a better chance of successfully restoring the King Over the Water. Now if the Jacobites had succeeded here, the ensuing history of Britain, Europe, and arguably even much of the globe would have progressed in a very different direction. Enjoying its greatest level of public support, and backed by the superpowers of France and Spain, the Jacobite cause might yet rule the fate of all of Europe. The turn of the 18th century was a period of great change and uncertainty in Europe, and an enormous amount of important history is condensed within the three decades of 1690 to 1720. In order to fully explain why the Jacobite Risings of 1708, 1715 and 1719 occurred, we need to unpack this complex narrative into the myriad short and long-term factors that combined to produce it. In this first of three jam-packed history films, we'll examine these interconnected factors in detail, beginning with William's European campaigns. We'll then check in with James VII and II and the Jacobite resistance, before investigating the tragic, catastrophic folly of Darien, Scotland's doomed bid for empire. It's time to secure the succession, colonise the Caribbean, and start learning French just in case, as we explore the momentous events of the 1690s and their causal effects on modern British history. Despite the momentous invention of the modern nation-state in the Peace of Westphalia in 1648, peace continued to be the exception rather than the rule in Europe. 
The continent was a cartographic nightmare, a fractal patchwork of duchies within states, within kingdoms, within empires, which meant that there was always some group of people killing each other over land, religion or ancestry. A war without end. In the last decades of the 17th century, the overarching European conflict was between Catholic France and the allied European powers of the League of Augsburg. This grand alliance of what's now called Germany, Austria, the Netherlands, Britain and Spain was entrenched in a series of defensive campaigns against the colossal expansionist might of French King Louis XIV. The complex motivations for this war encompassed dynastic and sectarian feuding as you might expect, but also clashing political philosophies. The progressive Dutch Republic, for example, was ruled by a council of representatives of its provinces, an early version of a parliament, not the divine will of the monarch, as opposed to the authoritarian, absolute monarchy exemplified by Louis XIV. But the deepest roots of this conflict lay in the historic French Habsburg rivalry. Since the 14th century, Central and Eastern European lines of succession had been dominated by an aristocratic and famously incestuous Austrian family known as the Habsburgs. The Habsburg monarchies of modern day Southeast Germany, Hungary and Austria held enormous power and influence in continental Europe, with the notable exception of its second largest nation, France. Here, the royal heritage lay with the Bourbon dynasty, with Louis XIV the latest in a lineage that had ruled France since the 16th century. The Habsburgs and Bourbons were mortal foes and this animosity would only increase in time, despite the fact that Louis XIV and Leopold I, the Habsburg Emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, were actually cousins. What? <laughs> yep, you really couldn't make this stuff up. The balance of power between these two dynasties was maintained by ensuring the succession of the status quo, that is, keeping Habsburg derrières on the relevant thrones to inhibit and encircle France. But who was Louis XIV, and why was France so powerful under his reign? Well, since his coronation in 1643, Louis XIV's long reign had transformed the French nation into a military-industrial superpower through its enormous army, its absolute centralised authority, its massive tax base, and the vast personal wealth of the Bourbon dynasty. French military might was unmatched because it had by far the greatest population of all European nations at around 21.5 million inhabitants. For context, in 1700 England had around 5.1 million people, Spain 8.7 million and what we now call Germany had 16 million inhabitants. Against the sheer numerical superiority of the French, no nation alone could hope to defend itself. The absolute rule of Louis XIV over his 21.5 million French subjects allowed for a centralised power structure in which the vast armed forces at his disposal could be rapidly deployed and commanded. Louis was endowed with an incredible energy, somehow managing to keep an iron grip on all facets of his government. Military service was not a multiple choice question, and let's just say that the Protestant Reformation hadn't exactly caught on under Louis XIV's staunchly Catholic reign, or rather, Louis's own personal version of Catholicism. Historically speaking, we can say that there are authoritarian monarchs, and then there's Louis XIV. Like James VI and I in Britain, Louis was an exemplar and entrenched proponent of the divine right of kings, declaring l'état c'est moi, literally I am the state. It was said that not a single official decision in France could be made without Louis's explicit approval. In practice, of course, given the size of France, this seems a tremendously inefficient arrangement, but you get the idea. Louis was certainly not a man burdened with an excess of modesty. He styled himself the Sun King, God's representative to France and indeed Earth. This was a guy who every morning had his servants, uh, sorry, ministers, form a long line in order of hierarchy to pass his clothes along from drawer to monarch until the most trusted finally handed the divine king his undergarments. <laughs> you thought your job was bad. Louis' gargantuan ego aside, 
It was his top-down style of government that the Jacobites sought to restore to Britain, the divinely chosen monarch answerable only to God himself. The increasing power of Parliament was seen as a threat to this ideology because, of course, men were held to be inherently sinful and corrupt, unlike their supposedly divinely chosen representatives. As we'll see, whether divinely chosen or not, men were still men. By 1678, Louis XIV was by far the most powerful monarch in Europe. He gained territory by means of annexation, political intimidation or good old violence, which he went on to defend and even extend in the brief and misleadingly pleasant sounding War of the Reunions of 1683-4. He claimed titles for himself and his family through his Paris courts, then attacked the corresponding western regions of the Holy Roman Empire. In this manner, he had already annexed large portions of what we today call Belgium, the Alsace, Luxembourg, the Palatinate, and what would come to be called Saarland. The War of the Reunions was ended by the clear demarcation of a new eastern French border under the Treaty of Ratisbon, but the general feeling among the rest of Europe was that Louis could not be trusted one inch. French expansionism was an existential threat to all nations, but particularly to the countries of the Protestant Reformation. There was certainly no toleration or freedom of conscience being indulged in Louis France. He had exiled the Protestant Huguenots earlier in the century, and defying the king's chosen faith was a sure way to a similar fate or an early death. The Habsburgs and their powerful allies could not tolerate even the slightest chance of Louis's Catholic dictatorship coming to rule all of Europe. It jeopardised not only, as mentioned, the Protestant Reformation itself, but the very small, wavering steps towards greater freedom and democracy that had been made in the handful of Protestant countries as a result of their breaking free from the relative ideological restraints of Catholic tradition. The stakes didn't get much higher than this. Now, if anyone's still unclear on what all this has to do with the Jacobites, France was the only realistic means by which the Jacobites could seriously threaten William's reign. Without French military support, there were simply too few Jacobites in Britain to pose a threat to the greatly enlarged British army, even though the majority of this was deployed to the continent. But in the old alliance between Scotland and France, the door lay ajar for James VII and II to return in a Jacobite uprising, backed by Louis's French expeditionary force. Louis had granted asylum to James VII and II not because he particularly liked him, but because the aims of the Jacobite cause generally aligned with his, that is, the removal of William of Orange. But despite his formidable power, Louis relied upon James' claims to the British crowns to legally dethrone William just as much as James needed Louis' army to provide the muscle. If James could gain access to the British mainland via Jacobite-controlled Scotland, as he had planned in his Irish campaign in 1689 before William had routed his troops at the Boyne, he could overwhelm the Orange Man's home guard by simultaneously invading England from the north and south. But this would require the element of surprise, and, as we'll see, if there was one thing at which the Jacobites were completely inept, it was keeping secrets. In response to renewed French aggression, William of Orange used all of his powers of negotiation to bring about an alliance between the Dutch Republic, England and the Habsburg monarchies, Austrian Germanic territories of tremendous wealth and power whose influence spread far beyond lines on a map. This League of Augsburg was joined by Savoy and Catholic Spain the following year. Now, if you're wondering why Catholic nations would ally with their bitter Protestant arch enemies, well, the answer is that the French Habsburg rivalry was an even more fundamental conflict than that of sectarianism. Arguably, the most strategically important branch of the Habsburg family to the Grand Alliance was that of King Carlos II of the Spanish Empire. Carlos II's reign formed the southern wall of the Habsburgs' continental encirclement of France and, crucially, gave them control of the Strait of Gibraltar, the gateway to the Mediterranean, 
we'll come back to Carlos II. But first, we need to explain what we mean by the phrases Holy Roman Empire and what we now call Germany, because this will become relevant later in the story. Germany was at this time a jigsaw of small states, bound together under the nonsensical title of the Holy Roman Empire of the German nation since 1512, but the Holy Roman Empire had existed since 800 CE and would endure until 1806, the original Thousand Year Reich. If you've ever wondered why Hitler referred to Nazi Germany as the Third Reich, well, the Holy Roman Empire was the First Reich, and the German Empire of 1871 to 1918 the Second. However, by the late 17th century, as Voltaire dryly observed, the First Reich was in no way holy, nor Roman, nor an empire. Its total population in 1700 was around 27.4 million, but to say its power structure was fragmented is like saying Britain gets a bit of rain now and then. The Holy Roman Empire was more a feudal union of personal association, bound to an elected emperor. Yep, I said elected. You see, the Holy Roman Empire was actually a quasi-democracy whose emperor, admittedly almost always a Catholic Habsburg, was actually voted for by archbishops. But wait! The archbishops were actually in the minority of states deemed electorates, the Catholic territories of Mons, Cologne and Trier. The other electorates comprised the secular territories of Saxony, Bohemia, Brandenburg and the aforementioned Palatinate. Now, secular does not mean atheist. Such a concept remained essentially unthinkable. Secular territories were simply those without an official state religion. This arrangement of self-determined religiosity was the result of the 1555 Treaty of Augsburg, after which the Grand Alliance was named, which had established the key principle of a sovereign being able to choose the religion of those under his dominion, resulting in German states with greater autonomy, splitting into Lutheran and Catholic territories. The 1648 Peace of Westphalia, meanwhile, had left Germany further fragmented and resentful at its relative insignificance following the redistribution of land and resources around the empire. Territories such as Bavaria, a southern state around Munich, and the northern domain of brunswick lundberg otherwise known as Hanover, had gained in wealth and influence since the Treaty of Augsburg, but, much to their frustration, did not hold the status of electorate. This was remedied by the Holy Roman Emperor Leopold I's upgrading of these territories to give them the vote, with Hanover being made an electorate in 1692. Why is this relevant to the story of the Jacobites? Well, it's a good question, but we'll get to that. Thanks to William's acquisition of the English throne in the so-called Glorious Revolution of 1688, the League of Augsburg was heavily supplemented by the armed forces of the three kingdoms of the British Isles, whose Protestant establishments naturally opposed Louis' France, a mere 33 kilometres or 20 miles away, over the water of the English Channel. This is the reason William accepted the Immortal Seven's bizarre invitation to take the English throne, he wasn't interested so much in power over the three kingdoms as in being able to command their military forces and tax their populations to fund his war. By 1697, his taxes on the three kingdoms were paying no less than 45% of the cost of William's multinational army and providing a quarter of its manpower. William's reign saw a monumental change in British foreign policy. Not only did he begin the process of rebuilding the Royal Navy from a small, ineffective fleet into a position of global maritime supremacy, he greatly increased the size of Britain's standing armies, including the Scottish Highland regiments such as the Duke of Argyles. Between the Union of the Crowns in 1603 and the Glorious Revolution of 1688, England had been actively involved in continental warfare for less than 13 years, but between William's coronation and 1714, British soldiers were almost always on the front lines of European conflict. This was the most significant level of British intervention in foreign affairs since the Age of the Crusades, and necessitated an unprecedented coordination of its human and financial resources that would eventually lead to Britain's emergence as a dominant military and financial power with greatly inflated ambition upon the global stage. 
this extraordinary transformation was achieved in less than 20 years. The main reason for this process was William's need for a capable British military, and when he took over in 1688, it was anything but. In September 1688, Louis XIV returned to his French reunionist agenda, setting his sights on more territories along the Holy Roman Empire's western border. Without declaring war, he crossed the River Rhine and marched into the electorate territory known as the Palatinate, hoping for a quick conquest. It's likely Louis expected the empire to practice appeasement in order to avoid a war, but he miscalculated. The Holy Roman Emperor Leopold I and the various German princes whose titles stood to be usurped, however, had no such intention and joined the Dutch Republic in declaring war on France. So began the Nine Years' War, also known as the War of the Grand Alliance or the War of the League of Augsburg. Some historians even refer to it as the War of the English Succession, because Louis had also recognised James Francis Edward Stuart, if you'll remember James' son and heir, as the Prince of Wales, that is posh code for heir to the English throne. But it's unlikely those in territories being invaded by Louis on the continent saw it this way. We must be careful not to approach these events from an overly Anglo or British-centric perspective because, as we'll see, there's already plenty of that going on in the actual history. It's considered by historians to be the first global conflict, with fighting in Europe, North Africa, the Indies and Americas, as the battle raged for the colonies across the farthest flung reaches of the globe. Things did not go well for William in the initial years of the war, and this was due in part to the inadequacy of British armed forces. He would be made aware of the weakness of the Royal Navy in June 1690, when 56 English and Dutch ships under the command of Admiral Torrington were forced back to the mouth of the Thames by 68 French vessels under Admiral Tourville, in an engagement off Beachy Head at the loss of six Dutch and one English warships, with no French losses. If Louis had followed up on this, all bets were off. At the following court-martial, Torrington declared, most men were in fear that the French would invade. The whole nation now exceedingly alarmed by the French fleet braving our coast even to the very Thames mouth. Tourville even made landfall at Tor Bay of all places, raiding Tainmouth. James implored Louis to seize the initiative and launch a full invasion, but the sunking could spare no more troops at this point. The threat of a Franco-Jacobite invasion loomed large over Britain until 1692 when a combined Anglo-Dutch force defeated the French fleet in the Bay of La Hogue. This was a mere reprieve, however, as a year later, Admiral Tourville destroyed part of the Levant-bound Anglo-Dutch commercial fleet at a loss of around £1 million. Over the whole Nine Years' War, the French captured around 4,000 British merchant ships and their often highly valuable cargo. The scale of such losses to French privateers was a powerful impetus for William to greatly enlarge and strengthen the Royal Navy, to such an extent that it would soon come to not just defend, but rule the waves. Meanwhile, the land war was consuming the armies of the Grand Alliance at a rate it could ill afford. The Alliance suffered terrible defeats at the Battles of Steenkirk in July 1692 and near Wenden the following year, while French siege tactics led to their capturing Mons in 1691, Namur in 1692, Huai in 1693 and Charleroi the following year, losing thousands of men and hemorrhaging support for the war among its populations. To many it seemed increasingly likely that against the flames of the Sun King, there could be no victory, no end to the war's burgeoning cost in lives, resources and hard capital. In Britain, William's increasing taxation of everything from land to windows in order to fund the war was proving ruinous to the British public and devastating Scotland, rallying many with no great love for the Stuarts to the Jacobite cause. In December 1694, Mary II died. William lost not just his wife, 
but his claim to the English and Scottish thrones. While William carried maternal Stuart genetics, Mary Stuart had been the daughter of the previous king, the exiled James VII and II. This left Mary's sister Anne as the last Protestant Stuart heir to the throne as per the 1689 Bill of Rights, and Anne had lost no less than 16 children to miscarriage or illness. Her 17th, William, Duke of Gloucester, was a sickly child, and while he had rallied in his teenage years, this was not considered a particularly secure line of succession. If Gloucester died, there were no more Protestant Stuarts to turn to, and it should by now go without saying that the Catholic Stuarts, that is James and his issue, were not an option. This insecurity gnawed at those who had invited the glorious revolution, and wider Protestant society returned to the paranoia and existential dread of earlier years. William now ruled alone, and in increasingly poor health of his own. His chronic asthma had begun to worsen, no doubt exacerbated by the damp British climate, and his crown lay in jeopardy. Finally, a ray of hope came on the heels of the deeply inconvenient, to William at least, Glencoe Inquiry. In August 1695, the Grand Alliance retook Namur, a much-needed, morale-boosting victory that, while incremental, demonstrated that the French were not invincible. William's persistence in defending the Spanish Netherlands was actually keeping the French at bay, but his allies in the League of Augsburg were becoming increasingly distrustful of each other. Such a close alliance with Protestant nations was decidedly unpalatable to the Catholic Habsburgs, and it was only William's deft diplomacy that was keeping the alliance from fragmenting completely. The Holy Roman Emperor Leopold I had even begun to conduct clandestine peace talks with Louis as soon as 1692, while in 1696 the so-called Allied Savoy signed a separate peace deal with Louis XIV, taking it out of the war. William had to deal not just with his enemies on the battlefield, but his squabbling, disingenuous allies as he laboured to hold the many spinning plates of the Grand Alliance aloft. Talk about high maintenance. By 1697, the Nine Years' War had reached a stalemate, and the cost of war was becoming unsustainable to both sides. The historic introduction of the national debt had provided the funds to continue the war, and while British credit, like Louis' war chest, was considerable, it was not infinite. It became a matter of who would blink first. Eventually, in 1697, the Treaty of Ryswick was signed by Louis and the Alliance. This actually restored a great deal of the territory gained by France in 1688 and demanded that Louis recognise William, not the exiled James, as the rightful ruler of the British kingdoms, which he did. At least for a while. Technically, this goes down as a score draw, but in real terms, it was a victory for the Grand Alliance and a rather chastening setback for Louis. Parliament in London called for the British armies to be disbanded, to allow the economy to recover from the years of costly war. There were celebrations in Britain, and much public rejoicing at King William's new years of peace and prosperity. Louis may have received a knuckle wrapping at Ryswick, but the Sun King had an ace up his sleeve. Carlos II of Spain's imminent death brought a new problem for William and the Habsburgs because, in line with the late Carlos' wishes, Louis' grandson Philip of Anjou was to inherit the Spanish throne as Philip V, breaking the Habsburg encirclement of France and greatly expanding Louis' Catholic dominion with the riches and military might of the Spanish Empire. Determined to maintain a Habsburg grip upon the Spanish peninsula, the Holy Roman Emperor Leopold I insisted that his son, and not Philip, should be on the Spanish throne. William even tried to negotiate a peaceful agreement to restore the Spanish crown to the Habsburgs, but to no avail. Louis' potential alliance between Catholic France and Spain was terrifying to Protestant nations and threatened Bourbon domination of all of Western Europe another war seemed inevitable. But William's troubles were not confined to the Continental Theatre. The Jacobites in London and Edinburgh most certainly did not recognise him as the legitimate monarch, and throughout the 1690s made elaborate plans to facilitate James' invasion, take the British Isles out of the Nine Years' War, and to assassinate 
the hated Dutch Billy. Despite the collapse of the 89 Rising, Jacobites across Britain continued to pursue a second Stuart restoration by any means necessary. As mentioned, British Jacobite numbers were not great. Only around 1 in 7 landowners in mainland Britain supported James' restoration, but crucially a far greater number would not oppose it, as the nervous ruling Whig junta were painfully aware. But now the interests of the Jacobite cause began to diversify according to which part of Britain you were in. Restoring the Stuarts became a proxy for nationalist goals in each of the three kingdoms, and many of Jacobite persuasion viewed James' potential return more as a necessary evil than a desirable outcome. For example, Scottish Jacobites, generally Catholic or Episcopalian, greatly resented William's replacing Episcopalianism with Presbyterianism as Scotland's lawful religion in 1690, while in England there were even Protestant Jacobites, Anglicans who refused to swear allegiance to William as long as James and his son lived. Some of these English Jacobites, such as William Penn, the Bishop of Ely and Lords Preston, Dartmouth and Clarendon, wrote to James in late 1690, bidding him invade, but conscious of recent history, with the stipulations that he must only use the accompanying French military for his own protection, and that the terms of his restoration must be determined by Parliament. They would certainly have had their work cut out to get James to agree to such terms, however it was rendered academic, as the letter and its bearer John Ashton were intercepted at Tilbury and the conspiracy exposed. Ashton was condemned to death the following year, and on the scaffold he handed a prepared statement to the sheriff. This was carefully worded to be as inflammatory as possible, eloquently explaining the Jacobites' opposition to the Dutch coup in a way that ensured it would be widely circulated afterwards. Ashton claimed that these new methods of government, by which he meant the ascendant model of parliamentary sovereignty over that of traditional authoritarian monarchy, were ruining the nation and endangering the Church of England. There seemed to me no way to prevent the impending evils, but the calling home of our injured sovereign. I am so far from repining at the loss of my life, that had I ten thousand, I should rather think myself obliged to sacrifice them all. Ashton's martyrdom indeed provided fuel to the fire of the Jacobite resistance. James made Ashton's son a baronet, and the English government was even forced into producing a pamphlet to counter Ashton's inflammatory call to arms. The Jacobites did well in the Scottish elections and were increasingly well represented at Parliament House, to the horror of the majority Whig government. Meanwhile, over the water in the Palace of Saint-Germain, on the outskirts of Paris, the exiled James VII and II was beginning to wear out his welcome among the French establishment. Shortly after James returned to France from Ireland, following his Irish Jacobites' bitter defeats at the Boyne, Ogrim, and the Siege of Limerick, he made his annual retreat to the convent at La Trappe, France's strictest, most pious monastery, where he took spiritual advice from the thundering abbot, Armand Durancy. Durancy is famous for establishing an ultra-Catholic sect known as the Trappists, who weren't exactly renowned for their wild parties, and the Stuart took great inspiration here. James was very keen to display his deep piety and unshakable devotion to his faith to anyone who cared, but few did. His overly performative prostrations failed to endear James to the French nobility, who found him a foolish, uncultured and socially inept bore, more awkward embarrassment than honoured guest. James' court in exile at Saint-Germain had the atmosphere of a mausoleum, with strict rules prohibiting laughter, unnecessary conversation, and, God forbid, public or even private displays of affection, particularly testing for those of double Y chromosomes, as, by all accounts, 
there seemed to be a regular parade of extremely attractive young women around the palace. The French saw James' lack of compromise during his short reign as laughably naive and self-defeating, with one particularly snarky bishop remarking, There goes a very good man. He gave up three kingdoms for a mass. Now that's sarcasm. <laughs> Anthony Hamilton provides us with a scathing summation of the mood at Saint-Germain. Our occupations have all the air of being very serious, and this is no place for those who do not either spend half the day in prayer, or pretend to do so. Common misfortune, which usually brings its victims together, seems only to have sown discord and bitterness among us. The friendship which we profess for each other is always simulated. The hatred and envy that we conceal is always sincere. Agreeable flirtation, even lovemaking, is severely prescribed in this melancholy court. James' poor conversation skills and abject lack of social graces led to ridicule from his hosts, the ageing exile endlessly regaling his unfortunate dinner companions with relentlessly iterative accounts of how he had been betrayed, how the events that saw him in their company instead of on the British thrones were a great injustice for which he bore no responsibility. Those who could keep a straight face at such proclamations would have found their countenance tested, however, by the cost of entertaining the exiled Stuarts and their sizeable expensive court. James lived at the Chateau de saint germain en laye with his wife Mary of Medina and their children, Louisa, Mary's eldest surviving issue, and James Francis Edward, whose birth and baptism as a Catholic, viewers may remember, was the final catalyst for English Protestants to engineer the coup to replace his father, known as the Glorious Revolution. The rumour persisted in England that James Francis Edward was not actually James' son and had been smuggled into Mary's arms in a bedpan to ensure a Catholic heir to James. We'll come back to James Francis Edward and the veracity of these outlandish claims in part two. James may have been seen as a bore, but Mary was quite popular with her courtiers and French contemporaries, particularly the nuns of the convent of Chaliot, where she would take Louisa. But the funds the family were consuming were not their own. Despite James' professed piety, the Stuarts were in fact enjoying an indulgent lifestyle at the expense of the French taxpayer. Understandably, the wider French population began to resent the huge sums of money being lavished by Louis upon the Stuart court when Louis's endless wars were eviscerating his citizenry and driving the French economy towards a serious financial crisis. Their earlier sympathy with James, and their fury at his daughter Queen Mary II's shocking betrayal, had soon transformed into resentment at this costly exile who had brought his downfall upon himself. But James was as oblivious as ever to his public standing. He was determined to re-establish Catholicism as the Church of the Three Kingdoms of the British Isles, through toleration and indulgence, because that worked really well last time. But most English Jacobites, including John Ashton, were similarly pragmatic in their demands, advocating compromise and pardon for those who had aided William, on the sound reasoning that neutrals, i.e. those who had simply not actively opposed the Glorious Revolution, would be greatly disinclined to support a second restoration if it meant that they might be executed as collaborators. Jacobites who advocated this moderate approach were known as compounders, those who favoured a zero-sum campaign of mass conversion pardon the pun, to Catholicism and bloody retribution against all those perceived to be Williamites were termed non-compounders. See what they did there? Prominent among these hardliners was Lord Melfort, who, although he hadn't exactly covered himself in glory during James' unsuccessful Irish campaign, had the exiled king's ear in all matters of state. James greatly valued his counsel, and later made him Secretary of State for all three kingdoms. Wait, hang on. How could he be Secretary of State when, as we know, the Master of Stair already occupied this position under William? Well, this is one of the reasons that the exiled Stuarts would come to be known as pretenders to the thrones. They made appointments, issued declarations, and held court in Saint-Germain as if they were still in power, 
Spoiler alert, to be clear, they were not and never would be, but that didn't stop them from, as their detractors like to put it, pretending that they were. Lord Melfort, once Calvinist and now fanatically Catholic, possessed as breathtaking a level of intransigence as his divine sovereign. Melfort did not concern himself with trivial matters like charm, logic, diplomacy or compromise, seeing the Restoration as a holy crusade that transcended such petty considerations. You can see why James liked him. In late 1691, Melfort warned the rebels in Britain to be ready for revolution. Louis had finally decided to invade Britain as he controlled the English Channel, or so he believed. Even if it faced a pitched battle, this operation would present William with a war on two fronts in which his forces would be split and his attention drawn away from the more important continental theatre. James made plans for his triumphant return. He would land at Glasgow, with 14,000 of his Irish veterans from the Boyne and Outham, and 11,000 additional French troops, as well as 3,000 horse, for a total of over 28,000 men. He would then march into England and rendezvous with the Jacobites in the north of England, before continuing on to take London. Now the numbers that James had in mind here were certainly a force to be reckoned with, and he stood a good chance of victory. But to James' great disappointment, Louis could only spare enough ships to carry 8,000 infantry total, and James was forced to seriously downgrade his plans. Instead of Glasgow, he would land in Kent and entrap the whole English fleet in the Medway, causing the London establishment to capitulate a considerably more ambitious scheme with significantly less chance of success. Nonetheless, James issued a declaration, likely worded by Melfort, of his intent to reverse the illegal taxes imposed upon the nation and establish religious tolerance. But of course, he didn't accept any responsibility for losing the thrones. He did, however, include a list of those he intended to hold responsible for collaborating. Lawyers, juries and judges who had tried his supporters, even the Kent fishermen who had caught him on his first attempt to escape in 1688. This declaration didn't go down very well in England. Queen Mary upped her sass rating by republishing it with a range of sarcastic annotations, and Jacobites were generally appalled at the ridiculously petty list of those upon whom James wanted retribution. The Jacobites even hastily produced and circulated a counterfeit document removing all but four prominent Whigs from the hit list and promising lower taxes should James prevail. But Mary's jokes were made partly out of fear. In Britain, the threat of Jacobite victory was very real. Those living near the coast hid their valuables and many Williamite elites sent spineless letters of contrition to James in anticipation of the French invasion, such as the shamelessly unscrupulous John Churchill, the Duke of Marlborough, yep, the same guy who had betrayed James in his greatest hour of need during William's invasion, who now begged the Stuarts' forgiveness by supplying him with all English troop movements and warning him when Jacobites were in danger of exposure. Principles? Pfft, ain't nobody got time for that. By May 1692, the troops were amassed at Knott, waiting to board the ships, as soon as Admiral Tourville had taken care of the English Navy. But on the 29th, before the French fleet could even cross the Channel, Tourville was ambushed in the aforementioned Allied victory at the Bay of La Hogue, its ships driven aground and burned by landing parties. Yet again, the Jacobite plan came to naught. But James knew that William was losing popularity in Britain. The Dutchman's taxes on land and windows, for example, were of particular aggravation to those who possessed small holdings. While James may have been unpopular during his reign, he had chosen to tax luxuries only, a pretty egalitarian policy for the time. The worst affected grumbled that James would not have laid one farthing on land. It depends what he needed it for, 
They opposed the new moneyed interest, that is, the financial class of bankers and investors, which they associated with duplicitous Williamite politicking, or in common parlance, wiggery. The Earl of Aylesbury, a key Jacobite compounder, had a new plan to lure the Royal Navy into the Atlantic with false sealed orders and then invade while the country was unguarded. Yeah, this was about as harebrained a notion as it sounds. Nevertheless, Aylesbury was smuggled across the Channel to visit his exiled sovereign at Saint-Germain in April 1693. The ever-oblivious James was stunned to hear Aylesbury's ill opinion of his declaration and took his advice to issue a new version with less of the petulance. After explaining his idea to James and Melfort, Aylesbury was then brought before Louis himself to present his scheme for consideration, but Louis dismissed it out of hand. The English admirals could not be trusted, which is the first of many problems with the scheme. Aylesbury evidently earned the Sun King's respect, however, with his straight talking, warning Louis that even James' biggest supporters in Britain hated Louis so much that his arrival with a French army behind him would not endear James to the proverbial swing voter. Yep, that's right, the Jacobites were no fans of Louis XIV either, but we'll get to that later. I see you are a plain speaker and no flatterer, Louis smiled, and there is great reason in what you have said. Louis proceeded to directly intervene to make James more palatable to Protestant Scots, forcing the still reluctant James into promising the Scots Parliament constitutional status similar to that of England's, while leaving the religious settlement of 1688 untouched and offering indemnity to supporters of the Glorious Revolution. Yet another invasion plot was foiled in 1695 when the conspiracy was betrayed and the army mobilised. Undeterred, Aylesbury continued to liaise with a broad church of Jacobite supporters in London coffee houses and taverns regarding plans for invasion, while being careful, lest he end up like John Ashton, not to be seen to actually endorse them. These associates included John Fenwick, Captain George Porter, Sir John Friend and William Parkins, the latter two having amassed private arsenals in anticipation of revolt, and even the likes of Scum Goodman, a quote, professional actor, pimp and poisoner, who sounds like a character taken straight out of a Terry Pratchett novel. Later in 1695, Aylesbury met with Robert Charnock, who favoured a rather more direct approach to the problem. Aylesbury heard of Charnock's design to kidnap that is, assassinate King Billy. A tall order, but not impossible if planned correctly. However, its implications, that is, stirring memories of the killing of Charles I and the ensuing disaster of the Interregnum, would be a step that even most non-compounders would consider beyond the pale. In January 1696, the Jacobites were joined by one of the late John Bonny Dundee Grahams, closest officers and veteran of Killy Cranky, Sir George Barclay, who had returned from Saint-Germain. The idea of assassination instead of invasion was favoured by Barclay, who even propagated the lie that James had personally authorised William's murder. Of course, James had done no such thing. After all, he had watched his father being murdered by an executioner, and was dismayed when he learned of this ugly defamation. Regardless, the Jacobite plot was drawn up by Porter and involved around 40 conspirators, including all those previously mentioned in Aylesbury's liaisons. The plan was for Barclay and eight other men to shoot and dirk the king in his lightly guarded carriage while he was returning down a narrow, secluded country lane after hunting deer at Richmond Park, which he did regularly every Saturday. But on the allotted day of his assassination, William said he was ill and didn't fancy hunting. Strange, but possibly coincidence. But when the king did not keep his Saturday appointment with startled deer for an unprecedented second week running, the conspirators knew that this was not simple happenstance. Indeed, the next day, William's agents pounced 
and the king announced dramatically that a plot of his assassination had been thwarted. The scheme had been exposed by one of Aylesbury's dinner companions. His attempt to recruit Thomas Prendergast had resulted in the Irishman, disgusted by the plan for cold-blooded murder, tipping off the authorities, and around 300 Jacobites were arrested, including Aylesbury and Charnock. While Aylesbury was released after a year in the Tower of London, the latter was executed for treason and, like John Ashton, took the opportunity upon the scaffold for another bout of incendiary rhetoric. He had sought to rid the world of a public enemy who has kindled a war all over Europe. According to Charnock, William was not only a common usurper, but, get this, an unjust ravisher. Good Lord! The exposure of the assassination plot was extremely damaging to the honest cause. The impetus it had gained from the scandal of the Glencoe massacre was largely squandered by this ugly murder plot. Nevertheless, the Jacobite cause was joined by those such as William Montgomery, an Ayrshire landowner so enraged by not being made Secretary of State for Scotland, he had published a pamphlet called Great Britain's Just Complaint, in which he savaged William's reign and used the Glencoe massacre as a political football for good measure. Nice. He then formed the Club, a rogue cabal of MPs who disrupted the functioning of the Scottish Parliament by messing up orders and waylaying couriers. Yeah, that'll show them. Montgomery eventually fell a treating with King James' party in England, where he hatched a plot to incite rebellion that, yeah, you guessed it, was betrayed by a supposed ally. Despite this, the Jacobites in England were by no means defeated, and the honest cause endured among those more understated in their resistance. However, in the very last years of the 17th century, Scotland was making plans not for invasion, but for its very survival. William Patterson stood in the Panama sun and looked out to the vessels of the nascent Scottish merchant fleet in the glistening waters of the Bay of Darien. He listened to the sound of the settlers in the village, the warm air waving the saltire slowly and proudly above New Edinburgh, as if to confirm divine endorsement of this historic achievement. Here was the defiant act of Scottish enterprise that would see it rival England and the East India Company on the global stage. Here lay the door to the seas, the key of the universe, the bulwark of a new Scottish Empire that would rescue the nation from famine and destitution. Here in a place called Darien on the Isthmus of Panama, a narrow spit of land between the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans, lay New Caledonia. Scotland's very own plantation. Getting here had been a long, challenging battle in the face of adversity. The union of the crowns in 1603 had not brought the parity and economic benefits to Scotland it had initially promised, leaving the country increasingly financially dependent upon England. While a free trade arrangement had at first existed between Scotland and England, and Cromwell's Commonwealth experiment had legally acknowledged it, in reality, commerce with England was anything but free. The restoration of the Stuarts in 1660 had seen Scotland regain its political independence, but little in the way of financial security. The Navigation Acts of 1660 and 1663, which decreed shipments from the colonies could only be carried to England in English ships or those of the country of origin, had severely curtailed Scotland's access to the one nation free trade that the Union of the Crowns was supposed to deliver. The entire Scottish annual revenue amounted to little more than what the English economy brought in every two weeks. <laughs> 
The Scottish economy had been in dire straits for much of the century due to the cost of endless religious warfare and, in the 1690s, this was compounded by consecutive poor harvests, famine and disease. The Jacobites considered what they called King William's ill years as punishment from God for the Glorious Revolution. Scotland was a small nation with an even smaller population, only around one million people, and most of these lived in rural areas. At the end of the 17th century, only around 5% of Scotland's population lived in urban areas of over 10,000 people. Most of Edinburgh's 30,000 citizens were poverty-stricken, housed in cramped tenements along the high street, while Glasgow's population were in similarly abysmal conditions. The surest way to turn around the country's fortunes, the merchant class reasoned, was for Scotland to embark on an ambitious project that would allow it to compete with the other European nations in the enormously lucrative trading of African and West Indian sugar, tobacco and, of course, slaves. At the start of the 17th century, only Spain and Portugal possessed global empires, but the Dutch Republic harboured imperial ambitions of its own, as did France and England. The potential subjugation and enslavement, oh, oh sorry, profits to be made from trade with India, the Far East and the East Indies sparked a race between European nations to secure these lucrative virgin markets. Over the 17th century, the Dutch had developed the Joint Stock Company, whereby public investment was secured to make expeditions and establish colonies that, if successful, would provide significant return to the company's stakeholders and a stock exchange where said investments, or stocks, could be traded. These joint stock companies were the prototypes of today's modern corporations, and the Dutch model was hugely influential, not least, unsurprisingly, in England. The English East India Company, granted a royal charter by Elizabeth I in 1600, had grown from a small trading interest into a colossal, quasi-sovereign juggernaut generating astounding profits and wielding a power greater than any nation-state. As we saw last time, the Stuart King Charles II had formed the slave-trading Royal African Company in 1679, run by none other than his brother, the then Duke of York and now exiled Jacobite figurehead, King James VII II. The enormous revenue streams of the Royal African and East India Companies enabled them to provide loans to English monarchs in return for a monopoly on trade with the East Indies, and this is among the reasons that England's credit rating was so high. William was able to borrow heavily to support his war with France, but the French economy was facing disaster due to Louis' constant war, extravagance and France's inefficient and outdated systems of taxation. It should come as little surprise that, hitherto, Scotland had seen little of the astonishing profits these companies were making across the globe. While individual Scottish elites may have subscribed to the East India Company, Scotland itself did not possess the financial security of the English state. As we'll see, quite the opposite. Its credit rating was near zero and thus Scotland could not secure the massive loans from the East India Company that England could. To compound matters, Scotland could not trade its way out of financial crisis either. The Dutchman's coup and declaration of war on France in 1688 had had the effect of disrupting traditional Scottish commerce with continental Europe, because now many of the territories in question were officially enemies of Britain legal Scottish commerce was restricted to domestic, French and increasingly English markets, but the English Parliament enacted punitive customs duties on the main Scottish exports like salt, coal, linen and cattle, a deliberately ruinous strategy designed to keep Scotland in its place, that is, as many Whigs increasingly thought of it, a vassal state. This systemic economic repression was a result of the English merchant class reluctance to cede one iota of their rapidly growing economic agency, especially not to the Scots, a descriptor which the English establishment used pejoratively, in the same way that they did Irish, that is, to rhyme with scum. <laughs> 
the Gaels of Ireland and Scotland were considered lesser, subhuman people, there to be civilised and dragged into modernity by English dominion. But this openly racist, laughably ignorant and colonialist way of thought was prevalent among the powerful lawyers, financiers and politicians of the new political class in London and Edinburgh alike. We know from the Glencoe saga how the supposedly backward Gales threatened English and lowland profit, which made them essentially enemies of the state. In Ireland, Gales were subject to increasingly discriminatory laws prohibiting their doing things like running schools, holding public office or even owning weapons. By the latter half of the 17th century, the network of drove roads had become well established across the Scottish Highlands, with great herds of black cattle being driven considerable distances from the northwest coast and the Isles to be sold in Creef and Falkirk, where English traders could avoid the high levies south of the border. Similar circumvention of trade laws occurred in Glasgow, which emerged as a key commercial hub for the smuggling of contraband, such as tobacco from Virginia and sugar from the West Indies, while Scottish wool, coal, linen, deer hide and grindstones made their way in the opposite direction over the Atlantic to the American colonies. The English policies of repression had actually seen Scotland seek out alternative options to get round them, and many of these new trade networks would come to be coveted by English merchants. Now that William's reign had, ironically, freed the Scottish Parliament of the restrictive Lords of the Articles, giving it more freedom and independence from the Crown, the Scottish Parliament began to make its feelings increasingly plain. In 1693, it passed an Act for Encouraging Foreign Trade, a bond which stressed the great advantages that may redound to this nation by promoting a trade to the coast of Africa, America and other foreign parts. Montgomery's club survived his exile to France and became known as the Cavaliers, translation Jacobites, who were gaining greater representation in Parliament. Meanwhile, the Whig majority were paralysed by feuding factionalism, and to combat the Cavaliers, William installed James Douglas, the exceptionally wealthy Duke of Queensbury, to ascending roles culminating in Lord High Commissioner. However, Queensbury proved ineffective in quelling the Jacobites, partly, ironically enough, due to the Scottish Parliament's abject lack of funding. Its economy was in constant recession, and when the seven ill years of famine, which saw two failed harvests and several poor yields between 1691 and 1698 struck the nation, the situation in Scotland deteriorated into the kind of conditions we would today associate with a so-called third world country. Heavy rains meant mines were constantly being flooded, frequent gale force storms wreaked havoc on buildings and infrastructure, and roads, ports and dwellings fell into disrepair. Scotland may have been home to a thriving intellectual movement with several esteemed universities, but most of its million inhabitants did not have the leisure of such bourgeois pursuits. At this time, Scotland had one of the very poorest populations in Europe. Their poverty was absolute. Many went door to door begging, while some fell dead in the street. The Gaeltach was hit hardest by the failed harvest. The folk of the highlands struggled to produce a sufficient yield from their stony, barely fertile soil at the best of times. In winter they were often forced to bleed their cattle and boil the blood into cakes, and the shortage of basic staples such as peas, beans and, most importantly, oatmeal, brought unimaginable hardship and misery to the highlands. With no fodder, much of their livestock died from starvation, condemning many gales to a similar fate. God help the poor people, wrote one observer in 1696, for I never did see such outcries for want of meal. As if this wasn't bad enough, Scotland was then decimated by diseases such as typhus, dysentery and smallpox, the close-knit tenements and open sewers of urban areas providing ideal conditions for infections to spread. The death tolls were so high that bodies were piled up by the roadsides, 
and it's estimated that the population of Scotland was reduced by a whopping 13% thanks to these seven ill years. In a bid to escape the horror, around 50,000 Scots in the southwest of the country fled to Ulster, England or to join the armies of Sweden, Germany and even Russia. In all, nearly a fifth of Scotland's population were lost to hunger, disease and emigration over the 1690s. Clearly, the Jacobites were not short of rhetorical ammunition. Not only were Scottish taxes being used to fund a Dutch war with Scotland's main trading partner, the great number of men of working age being shipped to the front lines created a labour shortage in the country. The nation appeared to be in a death spiral, a destitute pauper on the European periphery, dependent upon the charity of others. Through the gloom, however, William Patterson and a group of Edinburgh merchants glimpsed sunlit uplands. Patterson was determined to reshape Scotland's image as an economic powerhouse rather than a poor, backwards-facing country of noble martyrs more concerned with their past than their future. To achieve this vision, Scotland must be bold, adventurous and ambitious. A colony, or plantation, should be established in an area lucrative for global trade, providing merchants with a point of trade that hopefully the East India Company did not. Patterson had been hawking this idea since the mid-1680s, but mainly due to his lack of charisma, his ideas had generally bored rather than excited his audiences. That is, until now. As we know, in May of 1695, it was unexpectedly announced by Tweeddale, William's commissioner to Parliament, that William was open to the Glencoe inquiry. But this was not the only surprise Tweeddale had in store for the assembled Convention of the Estates. If they found it would tend to the advancement of trade that an act be passed for the encouragement of such as should acquire and establish a plantation in Africa or America, or any other part of the world where plantations might lawfully be acquired, His Majesty was willing to declare that he would grant to his subjects in Scotland in favour of their plantations such rights and privileges as he was accustomed to grant to the subjects of his other dominions. After the decades of destitution, the estates and the wider Scottish public saw this as the light at the end of the tunnel. A Scots colony under the protection of the Royal Navy was a bright future indeed. The only question was where. Well travelled and having come into a small personal fortune, Patterson had set up in London as a merchant and founded the Bank of England. Patterson had heard tell of a tropical idyll called Darien in the Caribbean, a green land of plenty where the sun always shone, where crops grew without cultivation, where noble Indians knew where gold might be found, and crucially located at a point where the short land journey across the isthmus to the Pacific would save merchant seamen a long and dangerous voyage around Cape Horn. Darien would allow Scotland to broker trade between East and West, making a very handsome profit in the process. Patterson, sensing that the iron was hot, set about wining and dining various merchants and ex-military officers, sounding out potential interest and lobbying the relevant parties in Edinburgh so that his vision might be floated before the Parliament. It worked. On June the 26th, just a week after the report of the Glencoe inquiry, the Convention of the Estates passed an Act in Favour of the Scots Company Trading to Africa and the Indies. Edinburgh taverns and coffee houses soon saw the distribution of a pamphlet titled Proposals for a Fond to Carry on a Plantation, which explained the scheme in detail. It did not mention Darien, but proposed an immensely powerful company with quasi-statehood of its own, empowered to buy ships, pursue commercial opportunities in countries not at war with William, claim land for the Scottish Crown, form governments where necessary, and create the Bank of Scotland. There is no need to take up any time in setting forth the usefulness of plantations in general to all places, 
or to the Kingdom of Scotland in particular, seeing now at length persons of all ranks, yea, the body of the nation, are longing to have a plantation. Now let's be absolutely crystal clear. The opportunity Patterson and the Company of Scotland referred to was not simply trade in luxury goods, but people. Darien was excellently placed for the trading of African and West Indian slaves to the Spanish South Americas and British and French North American markets. The door to the seas Patterson had spoke of was in fact the door to the plantations, a national chattel house through which the inexorable business might flow to Scotland's great enrichment. Scottish merchants were deeply envious of the English company's monopoly on the slave trade, and it was considered only just that Scotland should be granted a seat at the imperial table profiting upon the misery, desperation and indentured servitude of fellow men and women conveniently deemed to be subhuman. The participation of Scottish elites in the culture of slavery was just as enthusiastic as that of any ignorant, well-fed investor of the East India Company. Horrifyingly, not even Highland clan chiefs were averse to selling their Gallic tenants to the Americas as slaves to make ends meet, and much of the slave cloth bound for the New World was actually made in Inverness by indentured gales. This inconvenient detail of Scottish history is often skipped over, either through simple ignorance or because it doesn't fit with the popular narrative of noble martyrdom the likes of Sir Walter Scott and Robert Louis Stevenson invented to sell their books. For more on Scotland's role in the slave trade, check out Scottish History Tour's excellent video on just this subject. And so the Company of Scotland Trading was formed, with William Patterson as its leader. The scheme was wildly ambitious, projecting a plan for the next 30 years and presenting Scotland as a new imperial power in waiting. It wasn't long, however, before cracks would begin to appear between the company's personnel in Edinburgh and those in London. The two factions were at odds where the company should be based. Patterson insisted on a London headquarters for simplicity of negotiation while those in Edinburgh saw it as only fitting that the Company of Scotland should be administrated from Scotland's capital. The English distaste for the Scots and the Scots' envy of the English played its part, and the English East India Company complained that its livelihood would be threatened by the Scottish Company, a line of argument taken up by English merchants who saw too much potential for French influence in the Scottish enterprise. Two cargo-laden ships of the East India Company had recently been attacked by French privateers with the loss of significant capital to its investors. The very last thing they wanted was another potential threat from a wild-card Scottish startup that seemed to be openly antagonistic to English interests. When the Company of Scotland spoke of ambition and economic independence, the East India Company and its allies in the establishment heard rabid anti-English sentiment. While not wholly unfounded, this perception contributed to a growing hostility towards Patterson's scheme. Some Whigs even claimed that the Scottish contingent were all Jacobite, and that the whole plan was a means to break free from the Union of the Crowns. It was made clear that the Scots should speak with respect for His Majesty and the English commercial class, despite said class being free to use whatever racial slur they fancied with regard to their Scottish contemporaries. The London faction of the company became increasingly irritated with their Edinburgh colleagues' refusal to even furnish them with a copy of the Act, when copies of the unofficial Proposals pamphlet were being circulated among London's political class, in other words, mostly the company's enemies. Eventually, the Edinburgh faction came to London, but they were greatly displeased by what they found. The proposed level of investment, £300,000, was far in excess of their estimates and furthermore, Patterson himself stood to profit disproportionately well from the scheme. It was questioned by London financiers whether there was even enough liquid capital in Scotland to meet the total subscription requirement. But such was the London faction's ambition, this grand undertaking could not be done on the cheap. No effort or expense was to be spared in laying the foundations of the Scottish Empire. 
Indeed, many interested parties saw such a high figure as, to borrow a phrase, reassuringly expensive. This was a serious endeavour that promised serious profit. No sooner had the official subscription book been opened in London before it was filled at the full £300,000. Greatly surprised that such a sum had been raised by the second poorest country in Europe, the English establishment now turned its full wrath upon the impudent company of Scotland. Both Houses of Parliament delivered an address of protest against the scheme, which amounted to the renowned political diktat, it's our ball and they can't play. William, irritated by the distraction, declared that he had been ill-served in Scotland. Wait, now you realise that? In January 1696, the board of directors of the company were forced to testify in front of a common select committee, who duly called for their impeachment. This made all subscribers withdraw their funding, and the London venture collapsed. Patterson returned to Scotland, determined to make his plan a reality, despite such dangerous opposition. He was not alone in resenting the prejudice and disingenuous politicking of the English establishment, and Scottish interest in the company increased, galvanised by the old enemy's distaste for the enterprise. So the English Parliament thought that it could deny Scotland its share of empire, huh? Not on Patterson's watch. In February, the company opened a new subscription book in Edinburgh, this time for a total of £400,000. This was it. The last roll of the dice. Scotland had to shoot for all or nothing. The fire of resistance to English subjugation paid a rich dividend, and again the company was fully subscribed in short order with investors rushing to get their name upon the roster. The Company of Scotland united most of Lowland Scotland in a common cause, with poor Edinburgh tenement dwellers and landed merchants alike, all pledging what they could spare to see the scheme succeed. By the time Patterson handed off his plans and papers on Darien to the company, with his formal recommendation of its suitability for a colony, Almost half of total Scottish capital was now invested in the proud nation's final desperate gamble. Now that the company was fully funded, the hostility of its opposition increased. The East India Company issued a thinly veiled warning to the Scots in a statement that forbade its vessels and crew from engaging with the Scottish company in any way, even in an emergency and that all efforts would be taken to undermine the Scots' endeavour upon the seas. William now deeply regretted his initial support for the company. The last thing he wanted was for his northernmost kingdom to become less dependent on England. William condemned the Scottish scheme as dangerous folly, reprimanding the company for its impudence and inconvenient levels of ambition. To the company, however, this resistance from England, and particularly from the unpopular Dutch Billy, served as a powerful motivation to see the scheme come to fruition. Now, what Patterson had likely been reticent to mention in all his earnest lobbying, however, was that Darien was not simply a spare bit of territory lying around that no one wanted. The Isthmus of Panama was, like much of coastal South America, under Spanish dominion. Spain, as you'll remember, was a Habsburg monarchy and key member of William's Grand Alliance. Now, the likelihood that Spain and its puppet governments of Panama and Cartagena would simply turn a blind eye to Scotland's annexation of such a strategically important territory instead of blowing the Scots out of the water on sight was not great. This was one of but several calamitous misjudgments that would prove fatal to the Darien endeavour. In November 1697, the company assembled its newly acquired merchant fleet in the Firth of Forth in preparation for the first expedition to Darien, comprising the ebulliently named vessels the Dolphin, the Unicorn, the Endeavour, the Caledonia and the St Andrew. From January to June of 1698, the ships were loaded with supplies, while councillors and officers were selected for the first expedition including one of the villains of the Glencoe massacre, Captain Thomas Drummond, butcher of Inverigan. Closer to departure, these were joined by volunteers, that is, those of sufficient background to avoid getting their hands too dirty, 
and planters who would definitely be getting their hands dirty, doing the hard labour of Scotland's imperial expansion. These were mostly soldiers with family, discharged from duty such as those of the Argyle Regiment, who saw the expedition as preferable to pauperdom at home. Many of these Highland men had no language but Gaelic. The first expedition to Darien comprised a total of 1,200 colonists. On July the 14th, the fleet left Leith, made various stops on the way to pick up supplies, then sailed southwest across the Atlantic to the Caribbean Sea. Here, nestled at the very narrowest stretch of land between oceans, lay the Golden Bay of Darien. On November the 2nd, having visited Kirkcaldy, Madeira and the West Indies en route, even claiming a nondescript atoll called Crab Island for the company, the expedition reached what they christened Caledonia Bay, site of the proposed colony. The settlers struck ground at what would become New Edinburgh, and began construction of Fort St Andrew, where they would place the 50 cannon they had brought with them. One colonist, John Dalrymple, no, not that one, imparts the following in his memoirs. On the other side of the harbour, there was a mountain a mile high, on which they placed a watch house which, in the rarefied air of the tropics, gave them an immense range of prospect to prevent all surprise. To this place, it was observed that the Highlanders often repaired to enjoy the cool air and to talk of their friends whom they had left behind. The left behind included the significant amount of colonists who had died from illness on the long voyage. The settlers negotiated with native tribesfolk who could speak a broken Spanish. True enough, these natives, or as the settlers called them, Indians, knew exactly where the gold could be found, but they also knew exactly where the Spanish could be found, and these almost naked, nose-ringed locals were certainly not as primitive as the Scots thought they were. Of course, to these native people, the Guna, the new arrivals were just more pale-faced invaders after their gold, only these were even harder to understand. Now we should make it clear that the Scots did not abuse or mistreat the Kuna, indeed the tribe much preferred the Scots to the brutal conquistadors, but beneath the Scots friendliness lay the same motivation, to take the Kuna's land. The fact that the Scots had offered to pay for the land rather than simply taking it by force is a distinction without a difference. A colonialist with a patronising smile is still a colonialist. But negotiate they did, and even sent cordial greetings to the local Spanish governors, which suggests either astonishing naivety or astonishingly ignorant bravado. One native man they named Andreas who came to frequent the colony and another Ambrosio became the unofficial local ambassadors to New Caledonia, agreeing a treaty of trade and cooperation with the settlers. They asked the Scotsmen if they were here to displace the Spanish. The visitors said they were not, and at present had no quarrel with the conquistadors. The native men smiled at each other. Some of the Scots party questioned whether these guys were actually double agents, you think? And besides, where were the Spanish? They would have to be treated with sooner or later. But Andreas said the Spanish ships were elsewhere to the west. Besides, the colony had more immediate concerns. It's clear that Patterson, despite his obsession with the place, had never actually been to Darien before recommending a nation gamble over a third of its liquid capital into its colonisation. Put simply, there was a reason why this part of the isthmus was uninhabited. It was an area of swampland rife with mosquitoes and bordered by thick jungle that had to be cut back if you wanted to do anything with it. This meant the colonists had to use higher ground for planting, where the soil was thin, dry and infertile. Crops inevitably failed due to this poor soil and infestation by local fauna, which the colonists lacked any experience in dealing with. To compound matters, sickness was taking a devastating toll on the colonists. 
the Scots having no immunity to mosquito-borne diseases such as malaria, dysentery, and, well, you get the idea. December saw the arrival of the Morepa, a French frigate seeking refuge from Spanish forces. The captain was given amnesty, but would not divulge why the Spanish had engaged them. Many suspected this privateer had raided nearby Spanish holdings, and that the Morepa carried a cargo of stolen gold and booty. The captain told the Scots settlers that he had seen Spanish ships gathering in the west. When the drunken crew of the Morepa seemingly inexplicably set sail into a swelling tide the next morning, they were dashed upon the jagged rocks of the outer bay, the Morepa sinking with over half its crew and all of its cargo. The survivors were rescued by the Scots, but seemed in ungrateful, antagonistic mood. It turned out that the Morepa had indeed been laden with Spanish gold, silver and trading goods, and this, equivalent to a small national fortune, all lay at the bottom of the sea. Letters from the wreck would later wash ashore, revealing that the Spanish were trying to warn the native people not to cooperate with the Scottish settlers or face the wrath of France and Spain. On the 28th of December 1698, the Settlers' Council declared the settlement a colony of the Company of Scotland. Its high cost in lives to sickness and malnutrition was noted stoically. These brave souls had died in the name of Scotland's freedom. There wasn't much to show, however, for their sacrifice. Their rudimentary settlement lay on an exposed peninsula, and comprised little more than an unfinished fort and a hamlet of wooden huts. For this, 76 people had died between July and Christmas Day. The majority of these were planters, which, for all the pretty bluster of the declaration, showed the class system was the only thing thriving in this promised land. Predictably, the Spanish were enraged by this apparent British act of aggression that they heard tell. Their so-called ally at the time, William himself, had given his blessing. William moved swiftly to condemn the Scots settlement and reassure the Spanish that the matter would soon come to naught. But the Spanish saw that in reality William had no control over the Scottish settlement, and they would have to take matters into their own hands. Seemingly, however, the Spanish greatly overestimated Scottish military capabilities, and saw this as the tip of a planned British invasion. In January 1699, the Spanish Barlovento, or Windward Fleet, dropped anchor at Portobello, a military port just west of Darien, as the Spanish governors decided what to do about these disingenuous interlopers. Meanwhile, the company and its supporters in Scotland petitioned to have the Scottish Parliament send an address to the King requesting the protection offered in his statement of 1695. The proto-Scottish nationalist firebrand Andrew Fletcher of Salton wrote, they must not think that we have so far degenerated from the courage and honour of our ancestors as tamely to submit to become their vassals, when for two thousand years, whoa, steady on, we have maintained our freedom, and therefore it is not in their interest to oppress us too much. If they consult their histories, they will find that we always broke their yoke in the long run but their yoke had now infiltrated the Scottish Parliament. Despite the national patriotic fervour around Darien, and Scottish public opinion generally strident in its opposition to English arrogance and intimidation, the Edinburgh politicians were reading from a different hymn sheet. The Lord Seafield, Marchmont, Queensbury and the new Duke of Argyll were the chief opponents of this protest, influenced from the shadows by the nefarious master of stair John Dalrymple, murderer of Glencoe. Now Viscount Stair after the death of his father, John Dalrymple was a fanatical advocate of a full political union between Scotland and England, largely because it served as a means to defang the troublesome Scottish Parliament, which was now filled with far too many Jacobites for Stair's liking. The company's address to the king, 
did not make it through the Scottish parliamentary process without being significantly altered to render it as inoffensive as possible to the king. Marchmont called it an address to his majesty in such terms as shall please him. I'm so, so sorry. <laughs> it should come as no surprise that turning a document of protest into a simpering declaration of loyalty to William did not exactly endear the Scottish Parliament to the wider Scottish population. In January, the dispatch left Leith with much needed supplies for Darien, but was wrecked off Isla. In February, the first encounter with the Spanish saw the dolphin driven into neighbouring Cartagena, where it ran aground and was ultimately captured by Spain. The next day saw a land skirmish in which Montgomery routed an attack by the president of Panama, Conde de Canilla. Meanwhile at the colony, Andreas and Ambrosio had disappeared and were rumoured to be dead. But it was later that month that the final straw for many of the struggling settlers came in the form of a worldwide proclamation from William that spelt doom for the colony. In His Majesty's name and by command, strictly to command His Majesty's subjects whatsoever, that they do not presume on any pretense whatsoever to hold any correspondence with the said Scots, nor to give them any assistance of arms, ammunition, provisions, or any necessaries whatsoever, either by themselves or any other for them, or by any of their vessels or of the English nation, as they will answer the contempt of His Majesty's command at their utmost peril. This was war. William's minions claimed that the King had been unaware of the true nature of the Scots' enterprise, and that their activities were not in line with his encouragement of 1695, which of course they were almost to the letter. This devastating betrayal meant that no further supplies could be shipped to Darien. The colony was now in desperate need of food, medicine and clothing. The settlement was populated by starving, yellowing inhabitants as disease and malnutrition left men too weak even to finish the ditch around Fort St Andrew. The Scots fleet was merchant based and had no vessels capable of tacking into the wind, which meant that they were trapped in the Bay of Darien if there was a strong northerly wind unlike the advanced and terrifying Spanish Barlovento fleet, which could move quickly and effortlessly in any direction, a formidable tactical advantage the colony could not hope to counter. But the hubris of the Council of New Caledonia knew no bounds. There were those who publicly stated a wish for Spanish attack in order to demonstrate the new artillery guns now mounted on Fort St Andrew. Many of the colonists, however, took William's proclamation in the spirit in which it was dealt, and the council realised it could not prevent an evacuation from a settlement that had long become a living nightmare. So many had died that there was not enough able manpower to properly bury them. Of the 1,200 settlers who had arrived the previous summer, nearly 400 were now dead. Disease and starvation had ravaged the settlers of their pride and defiance. The dream was over. By June, the colony had been abandoned except for six sick men. The ships sailed to North America while the wind was favourable, and some made it back to Scotland. By any sensible reckoning, this should have been the end of the affair, but the Company of Scotland was determined to recoup its massive investment. The board of directors not only failed to disclose the abandonment of the colony to the public, but doubled down on the now inarguably doomed enterprise. Later in 1699, a second expedition left the Clyde bearing another 1200 colonists, under the impression that they were headed for a thriving tropical paradise. In reality, the majority were being sent to a slow, painful death. The dream they had been sold would be brutally shattered upon their arrival at New Caledonia, where they found Thomas Drummond, two sloops, and overcrowded burial grounds 
literally overflowing with the dead. Survivors later wrote of the ever-present, inescapable stench of decomposing flesh that pervaded the settlement. The company had tried to deny what it called the desertion of the colony, but the reality was painfully apparent in the hellish scene of death and despair that was New Edinburgh. The council and officers called a meeting at which it was agreed that all women and 500 men were to be evacuated to Jamaica. In its death throes, the colony of Darien, like the Company of Scotland during its conception, was riven by factionalism. Differing ideas and opinions between the settlers now turned ugly. Those deemed to be deviating from the original vision of the colony began to be labelled as criminals and even mutineers. Thomas Drummond had floated a plan for he and around 50 men to go native with the Indians, living independently so as to solve the problem of both descent and lack of supplies. This was dismissed by the council outright, but in reaction to the decision, one volunteer, Alexander Campbell, made the mistake of pointing out that if the council would not adapt to the changing situation, there was a possibility of rebellion in the colony that could see its masters swing from the proverbial yardarm. The next day, Campbell was arrested and imprisoned aboard the Duke of Hamilton without trial. In December, he was executed by hanging on the charge of mutiny. Drummond too was arrested and imprisoned, but likely due to stories of his bravery during the Nine Years' War, he was later released. In January of 1700, Williams surprisingly agreed to ask Spain to release the crew of the Dolphin. While at the colony, Robert Turnbull had been to visit the natives and returned with news that the Spanish were preparing for an imminent attack. February saw the arrival of the militaristic Campbell of Phonab, who wasted no time in bringing the fight to the Spanish, winning a much celebrated victory at Tubacante. But Thomas Drummond knew that there would be a fearsome retribution from the Spanish, and by now he had had just about enough of this godforsaken endeavour and its boneheaded leadership. Drummond left Darien shortly before said retribution arrived in the form of Don Melchor de Cabara, who landed to the east of the colony and quickly rebuffed an attack by the Scots, holding the landing site for his backup to arrive. This backup was Don Juan Pimienta, who made landfall later in the month with significant reinforcements. Pimienta offered the Scots terms of surrender, but despite the settlers' desperate situation, the council stubbornly refused to give in. They were determined to persevere in the face of now impossible odds. Ideology, bitter resentment and nationalistic fervour had long since replaced logic in the minds of the colony's leadership. Pimienta, surely nonplussed at the Scots' increasingly pointless resistance, advanced forward to the neck of the peninsula. Here, the only obstacle was a rudimentary ditch that the Scots had dug as a makeshift defensive position, and it would do little more than slow down any invader. On March the 18th, the Spanish duly crossed the ditch, ending any serious hope of the colony's survival. Now the council finally saw sense and asked Pimienta for a truce with a view to agreeing terms of surrender. But then the squabbling colony council members could not reach agreement on how to proceed, and hostilities resumed on the 22nd. At the end of March, Pimienta again offered terms which the council now had little choice but to agree to. The Articles of Capitulation were signed on March the 31st, 1700, which allowed the Scots to leave with their artillery, if they made it snappy. On April the 12th, the colony was abandoned for a second time, and Pimienta took possession of Darien. The settlers left on the Hope, the Rising Sun and the Duke of Hamilton, while the Hope of Bones was sailed to Cartagena, where it was surrendered to the Spanish. In May, the Scottish ships reached Jamaica. Later in the month, the Scottish Parliament reconvened, but Queensbury refused the company another address to the King, adjourning Parliament instead. This act of dissociation, together with the news of the Battle of Tubacante, caused widespread rioting in the capital. That night, 
The city of Edinburgh was under the control of armed mobs, and Whigs such as Queensbury battened down the hatches, fearful for their lives. In July, the Hope, the rising sun and the Duke of Hamilton left Jamaica bound for home, but the Hope became wrecked off the coast of Kuna. Encountering further adverse weather, the rising sun became dismasted, but it and the Duke of Hamilton managed to make it to Charleston in Carolina by late August. However, barely a week later, both ships were destroyed in a hurricane. In October, the Scottish Parliament met again and the company embarked on a fruitless lobbying campaign to establish Darien as a legal settlement, thereby falling under the protection of the Scottish Parliament. I mean, guys, do the words barn door, horse and bolted ring a bell? The colony of Darien, founded in such defiant vigour, had ended in a dreadful, humiliating capitulation. Cut down in its infancy by chronic infighting and mismanagement, English betrayal and Spanish contempt. We have no record as to how many of the 2,400 colonists who sailed to Darien survived the catastrophic endeavour, but estimates suggest that as few as 30 people made it back to the British Isles, which would represent a staggering mortality rate of 98.7%. Scotland's great gamble had failed. In the fetid, odorous decay of New Edinburgh lay the ruin of the Scottish nation, an unprecedented financial disaster most terrible in its implications. The country had not only lost nearly half of its liquid capital, but its dignity and its ability to function without assistance, condemning Scotland to a poverty and dependence greater than ever before. Little did the company know that, in their misguided attempts to join the great game of empires, they had in fact destroyed the one thing that they sought to protect, the ability of Scotland to make its own way in the world as a sovereign nation. For nearly a thousand years, the Scots had resisted invasion and insurrection to maintain their often bitterly won right to political autonomy. But from the disaster of Darien, there could be no return. Amid the wreckage of New Caledonia, torn asunder by the cruel winds of fate, lay the dream of Scotland's independence. Thanks for watching, and we hope you enjoyed the film. In part two, Union, we'll investigate the controversial choice of heir to Anne, the game-changing war of the Spanish succession, the long shadows cast by Darien, the deaths of James VII and II and William of Orange, the political chicanery in London and Edinburgh that led to the creation of Great Britain, and the Jacobite response in the attempted rising of 1708. Until then, enjoy your adventures. <laughs>